But the question is often asked, you believe that only those who believe upon Jesus Christ as their personal saviour will get to go to heaven? The answer, the, the answer to that is very clear. Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. He that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so the scripture is very clear that only those who are saved will get to go to heaven one day. I'm going to be singing a song this morning. It's got a nautical theme of a wonderful message. It's called Ship Ahoy. So listen to the message and the words as, as uh, it's got a good message. Go ahead. I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea the angry waves threaten my ruin to be when away at my side there i dimly described a stately old vessel and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, Ship ahoy. Twas the old ship of Zion. The sailing along All aboard her seemed joyful I heard their sweet song And the captain's kind dear Ever ready to hear Caught my wail of distress as I cried out in fear Ship ahoy, ship ahoy As I cried out in fear Ship ahoy The good captain commanded a boat to be lowered and with tender compassion he took me on board and I'm happy today all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior and now I can say, Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And now I can say, Bless the Lord. Oh, soul sinking down. Need since merciless way the strong arm of our captain is mighty to say then trust him today no longer delay board the old ship of Zion and shout on your way Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout and sing on your way, Jesus saves. Thank you, brother.
Brother Mike, Miss Jennifer. All right, it's time for Children's Church. Leslie's heading for the door. And so our young people are dismissed to Children's Church just now. Thank you so much. Again, greetings to those who are in the parking lot. If you can hear me, can you honk your horn? Okay, we've got a couple out there. Okay. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, we welcome you to our service this morning as well. Well, let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Romans. We are studying uh, presently the book of Romans and the theological systematic theology of salvation found in the book of Romans. We're still in chapter 1. And this morning we're going to read from Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through verse 22. The title of the message this morning is Turning Out the Light Will Leave You in the Dark. And we'll see what that is in just a moment. But let's all stand, please, for the reading of God's Word in the book of Romans, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. The Apostle Paul writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Father, we pray that you will help us this morning as we try to preach your word. We pray for those who might be listening, those who might be listening online or who will watch this later uh, on Facebook uh, or on YouTube. And we pray, Lord, for lost souls, that they would understand the truth of the gospel and their responsibility for their sin. And we pray for those who are here, Lord, who are not seeing, that you'd help them to understand the great danger in which they stand today and help them to come to Christ. We ask and pray, Lord, that you'll be with us in this service. And Lord, give us grace and give us strength. And again, we think of the Kirk family, Lord, that you will give them special grace and strength and help today, Lord. How we need you, Lord. And we pray for your help in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated if you would. Well, we said last time that we have come to really the, the end of Paul's introduction in the book of uh, Romans. And now... Uh, as he gives the gospel there in verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And really that's the whole, uh, that would be the key verse of the whole book. And that's an important lesson we find there in verse 16 and in verse 17. And as we said last time, what's going to take place now is Paul is really standing on the ledge. All the introductory matters are come to this point. And now he's going to go descend into a deep valley. And that deep valley, he's going to express to us and reveal to us and teach to us the depravity of man. In the first chapter, he deals with the irreligious, the heathen. People who don't have the Bible, people who don't know of... Uh, uh, the, the ways of the God, of God of Israel and uh, the depravity of man, uh, of the heathen. And then in chapter 2, he continues speaking about man's need, but he's speaking to the religious crowd, speaking to <clears throat> the, the, uh, the Jewish people and those uh, who knew the scriptures. And then in chapter 3, he concludes that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, that we're all under condemnation. So, uh, these next number of lessons, we're going to be dealing with uh, people's need. And of course, that's important. We understand that systematic theology tells us one thing before he tells us the next thing, before he tells us the next thing. And before a doctor can ever explain to you what the remedy is, he has to explain to you what, what your sickness is, what the problem is. And that's exactly what he's doing here in Romans chapter 1 and 2. He's explaining what our problem is. And so, in verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God. We understand that wrath is anger under control. Um, and really, uh, you know, God can be angry every day. He is angry every day with the wicked. Yet he doesn't express that. But when God displays his wrath, it's when his wrath is manifest. It's when his anger is manifested. It's basic, <clears throat> basically judgment that's coming. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. You see, God's in the revelation business. 
In verse 17, he says, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's revealed in the gospel. But he also talks about the need. Uh, the judgment that's coming is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Um, again, uh, we come from a different perspective because we are sinners and uh, we have enjoyed our sin. And uh, in times past, we have uh, uh, laughed about our sin or the sin of other people. And we look at sin differently, much differently than God does. God is so very, very serious about sin. And the Bible says that God will judge all sin, all unrighteousness, all ungodliness. And if you would take for just a moment and think about your life, is there anything that you would be ashamed to tell us? What about your sin? Is there anything in your past that is secret, that if it would be known, if, 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 if somehow the screen could be pulled down and we could put the projector on and we could bring some scenes from your life, maybe things that you've thought about, things that you've done, things that you've done with others or to others, if those uh, sins, those things of unrighteousness were brought up on the screen right now, and all the things, maybe you're thinking about those things right now, if everybody in here knew about it, would you be, would you be able to sit where you're sitting? Or would you be making for the door? And you know, we're just sinners like the rest of, we're all like that. But what about if those things are revealed um, in the sight of a holy God and his holy angels? How much more serious would that be? And God wants us to think about our need, that we are unrighteous and we are sinful and we are ungodly. And he warns us that the wrath of God is going to be revealed from heaven against that ungodliness. There is a day of judgment coming. He speaks about that over in chapter 2. He says in verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You know, sometimes we get a little, uh, a little picture of that when we're growing up, uh, when we do something wrong in the home, and our mommy's angry with us, or our daddy's angry with us, and we know that we're going to get a whipping. And that should uh, put the fear of God into us when those things happen. Those are just little glimpses of what it is to be in trouble, that there's consequences for wrongdoing. And if you don't learn that in the home, maybe you'll learn it in society. And uh, you do something wrong in society, you commit a crime, they're coming looking for you. And the police knock on your door, I'm telling you, it's going to bring fear to your heart because there are consequences for sin. But let me tell you something, the ultimate consequences for sin is not with your dad and it's not with the police officer, it's with Almighty God. Amen. That is the most serious consequence. The judgment of God is revealed, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And so we see that judgment is coming. And he's going to get into that a little bit later as well. But the question is often asked, you believe that only those who believe upon Jesus Christ as their personal saviour will get to go to heaven? The answer, the, the answer to that is very clear. Jesus said, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Peter said, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And so the scripture is very clear that only those who are saved will get to go to heaven one day. So then there's a second question that comes. Well, what about those people who have never heard of Jesus? They've never heard the gospel. They've never read a Bible. Don't even know there's such a thing as a Bible. Are those people going to go to hell? When they haven't even heard of Jesus. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. As he speaks in chapter 1 about the heathen. Those who do not know the Bible. Who are not exposed to the gospel. And so there's three very important principles that we find here. That help to uh, answer that question. Because it's a genuinely honest question. And it is a very important question. And it's one maybe that we've wrestled with from time to time. But the Bible answers that question like many others. And the three principles are this. The first principle is that every man has light. The second principle is that light received gets more light. The third principle is that light rejected brings darkness. If you turn out the light, then you're left in the dark. 
Now, the thing is, not everybody has heard the gospel. Not everybody's heard of Jesus. Not, not everybody's heard of John 3.16. We, uh, we're doing, all our, uh, you know, doing what we can to help everybody to understand those, those things and to give them the gospel no matter where they are. That's why we send missionaries around the world at great expense. We do that at great expense to them also as they give their lives to serve the Lord. But what we see here in this scripture is that God has already given to every single person that's ever been born into this world revelation of himself. That's what we mean when we say that God has given to every man light. Light is something that reveals. Light is something that helps us to understand. And God has given to every single person light. Now look please at Romans chapter 1 and verse number 19. He says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead. Now watch this last phrase, so that they are without excuse. There's nobody gets to stand before God and say, but now wait a minute. Um, I, you know, I can't be held responsible for something I've never heard. I can't be responsible for the gospel. I can't be, responsible, be held responsible. But God says you are responsible. You are without excuse. I want you to notice in chapter 2, verse 2, it says, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Do you know that God is a God of righteousness and holiness and justice? And all of God's judgments are according to truth. Well, then how can you condemn somebody who has never heard the gospel? How is it you're saying that they're not going to go to heaven, they're going to go to hell if they don't believe something they haven't even heard in yet? But now, wait a minute. Every single person has revelation. They may not have the gospel yet, but every person has light from God. Please turn back, keep your place there in Romans. Go to John chapter number 1, if you would. John chapter 1. God has revealed himself to every single person that has been born of Adam's race. Every single person born into this world has some light from God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, it's speaking about Jesus here in verses 1 through 3. All things were made by him, verse 3. And without him was not anything made. Well, it was made. This is the Word. This is the Logos. Uh, in the beginning was the Word. This is Jesus. And so in verse 4, it says, In him, in Jesus, was life. That's spiritual life. That's eternal life. And the life was the light of men. And he goes on to say in verse 5, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. John the Baptist came, and he pointed everybody to Jesus. Even the disciples of John the Baptist were redirected to follow Jesus. That's what happened with, with uh, Andrew and John. Uh, and when Andrew and John were following uh, John the Baptist, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew and John followed then Jesus. And then Andrew went and got Peter. He says, Come on, we found him. And, uh, and then uh, Philip followed the Lord, and he finds Nathaniel. Come on, we found the Messiah. And so John was not the light, but he was there to bear witness of the light. Verse 7, the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. Now, I want you to notice that it says all there. What was the intention of God? Is it that just some people will believe or that some people will get saved? The intention of God, the heart of God, is that all men through Christ might believe, through him might believe, and therefore be seen. The Calvinist idea that God arbitrarily chose some to be saved, the elect, and those not to be saved, the non-elect. And you see, if a person stood before God and said, well, God, you didn't choose me to be saved. How possibly could I be saved? I think he would have an argument against God. But that's not the truth. The truth is that Jesus truly died for every single person. His blood was shed for every person. He tasted death, tasted death for every man. His intention is for whosoever will may come. Uh, God, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that also come to repentance. And that's what God has revealed of himself. So uh, it is absolutely true that God will have all men to be saved. You say, well, what about the elect? Well, the Bible says you're elect in him. If you're not in him, you're not elect. But you have a choice to get in him. When you believe upon Christ, you're placed in him. You have the choice to believe upon him, to be placed in him. And if you're in him, then you're elect. Before I got saved, I wasn't elect. 
If you're not saved here today, you're not elect. You know how to get elect? Believe on Christ. Then you'll be placed on him, and then you'll be chosen for heaven. And he goes on in verse 8. He says, he was not that light, that is John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light. He was sent to bear witness of Jesus. Now watch verse 9. This is what I want you to see. That was, in other words, Jesus was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus gives revelation of himself to every man that comes in. Why? Because he wants every man in the world to be saved. God genuinely wants every single person to be saved. And so the Bible teaches us that every person has light. Let's go back to Romans chapter, chapter 1. Now what kind of light would that be? What kind of revelation or information would that be from God? Because it's not, it's not the Bible because lots of people don't have the Bible. See, the Bible is a very wonderful thing. It's the, the specific written down revelation will of God that you find is God has revealed himself in this book and where's that in no other way you're going to find things out about God but this is not the only source of revelation because in Romans chapter 1 verse 19 I want you to see this again it says because that which may be known of God is manifest the word manifest means revealed and what's the next two words in them for God has showed it unto them so every person's received light, and here's the way he receives light. He receives light on the inside. He also receives light on the outside. And then very specifically, he receives light in the spoon. You could also argue that we have light in Jesus Christ, the very person of Jesus, as it's given to us in the Gospels. He's the, he's the, the manifestation of God. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And so there's that, those four, but there's, there's two Specific kinds of light that are general to every single person that's ever been born into the world. He says that God is manifest in them. Now what is that? That's conscience. God has revealed himself in the heart and conscience of every single person ever born into this world. Now the Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. But you know you never see little newborn babies and say that's a fool. You know you're never born. You're not born a fool. Sometimes children are foolish, but, you know, the thing is that um, uh, we learn to be foolish. And that no one's born a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But, you know, it's interesting when you take the little children. But Jesus talked about childlike faith. And that it's easy for them to believe in the creator, God. Because God has placed that within every person. It's interesting in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 when God starts everything out, the first verse in the Bible, and it says this, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning God. It doesn't try, it doesn't even try to try to explain what God is. Same thing in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. In other words, when the beginning started, God was already there. And this concept of knowledge of God, he doesn't even try to explain because he knows that he's already placed in every heart a knowledge of God. And isn't it interesting that no matter what century you're in, it doesn't no matter what country you're in, what, uh, what tribe, what, um, what culture you're in, every single universal through time and universal through uh, the, the nations of the world, people believe in God. They believe in a supreme being. Now, they may call him different names. He may be approached in different ways. But every single person born in this world has a knowledge in their conscience that there's someone bigger than them. There's a creator, there's, there's a God. And, you know, as a little boy, I remember in Belfast, growing up, and God has placed in every man a conscience. Did you know that it doesn't matter if they've ever read, he talks about this in Romans, that God has placed the law of God on their, in people's hearts. You know, a, a person may not have read the Ten Commandments, have never read, Thou shalt not kill. And not a, not, a, not a word of those commandments at all, but when he kills someone, there's something that pierces his heart that brings tremendous guilt and heaviness to that person. Do you remember when you're a little boy or a little girl and maybe you stole something? You probably still remember it. I've told you about the time when I was, I don't know, about 11 or 12 and I learned how to shoplift. <laughs> I was still ashamed of it. But even before that, I remember, I've told you this before, uh, in, in our street in Belfast where we grew up, uh, Balhome Drive in Ardoyne, and uh, we had a, a little bit of a yard, not much of a yard, but maybe a quarter of the size of this room, and uh, there was a gate my dad had at the bottom of the yard, and um, there was a, a footpath on the other side of that, 
and we weren't allowed out, so we, the gate, you know, held us in. And I was over at the gate, and this other wee boy came along, and he was playing with his little car. And I said, come here. God help the wee, the wee lad. He came over to me, and I reached my little scrawny little arm through that gate, and I grabbed the hold of his car, and I pulled it inside. And immediately the wee boy started crying. He says, give me my car back. I says, it's not your car, it's my car. I stole his car, and he went home crying. Now, I, and, and I was probably, I, I don't know, maybe five or, five or six years old, maybe something like that, maybe even younger than that. And why do I still remember that? Because I remember the feeling that I had of that, after that, of guilt, of conscience of doing something that was wrong. And at that point, I'd never read the Bible. I've never read the Ten Commandments of God. There's something within every heart and in every culture that there is right and wrong, and there is someone to whom we're responsible. Because God has written it. He's written his law on people's hearts. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. They say, you know, there's no atheists in foxholes. I saw a question on, I guess it was, we read everything on Facebook anymore, but uh, someone asked the question, is there such a thing as a genuine atheist? And I think there is actually. I think people can be so darkened and so removed from the truth that in their mind, there is no God. But they didn't start out that way. They learned that. But that's why they say, you know, when you get in a certain circumstances of life and, and everybody prays, you know, um, and I think that's true. Um, God has manifested himself in every person. And so that's the conscience from within. That's a witness in every single heart. But there's also a witness from without. And that's the witness of creation. Look at verse 20. He says, for the invisible things of him. Now, is God visible? No, not normally. Um, so how can you believe in something that's not visible? Well, I kind of believe in error. I don't see it either. Jesus said, you know, explaining the new birth, he says, you can't see the wind. You see what the wind does. You can see the trees moving. You see the dust moving. But you can't actually see the wind. It's the same thing with a person who's been born of the Spirit of God. You can't see God, but you can see the results in a person's life. You can't see. But, you know, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's say not true. Right? Electricity, you can't see electricity. But I, I guarantee if you, if you put your finger in the socket, you're going to find out electricity is very real. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. What he's saying is that we can, th we can learn things about God. God has revealed the finger, his fingerprints all over his, his creation, the things that he has built, the things that he made. It tells us something about God. And not only that, but there's a receptor in each one of us that sees that. And, and it's wonderful, it's wondrous. Why is it when you're driving along and you see a beautiful, beautiful sunset and you'll nudge the wife and say, look at that there, isn't that wonderful? Why is it wonderful? Why? It's only light. Why would you think it's beautiful? Because God has put that receptor on the inside of us. How do I know there was a, a I mean, you and I were here, most of you were here when we, we built this, but if somebody came in, if you weren't here uh, this time last year, um, and th this time last year, this was a building site in here, okay? And... Uh, Where's Corbin? Corbin, he put a lot of these uh, two before walls up, him and his dad. He was working alongside his dad. And uh, you might not have been here, but I know that, and you know, even if you weren't here last August, you know that there was a builder in here at some point. Why? Because you can see what, what they did. You see the sheetrock, you see the, the tongue and groove, you see that's been stained and the lights that went in and the ceiling and the air conditioning. Um, it just didn't happen by accident, right? It'd be kind of nice if it would have, but no, it, it had to be thought out and had to be planned and had to be worked and had to be reworked. A lot of energy went into it because we can see what's been left. Now, if you go outside these windows and you look at these beautiful trees, why is it? And I love this place because, you know, it's completely surrounded by trees. You've got the, the, the highway going through there. The wintertime, you can see our neighbor over here. But most of the time, all you're, all you're looking at is trees all the way around. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Why is it beautiful? Why do we appreciate that? And in nature and in creation, we can see God's fingerprints. We see his power. Look up into the sky at night, and you can't see all the stars. These modern telescopes that they have, and they go off into the outer uh, universe, looking at all, not only the stars that we can see in the, our Milky Way, our galaxy, but all the 
trillions of galaxies that are out there with trillions and trillions of stars within those galaxies and you, it blows your mind. You think that's infinity. It's, you can't, how can you take all that in? And God in the Old Testament told Abraham, you can't number the stars and it's true. And when you think about what's up there, when you think of how big the universe is, it blows your mind when you think of us in comparison to all of that. God's power is revealed. And the Bible says it's clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. You're made, I'm made. We can understand some things as we see the, uh, the handiwork of God around us, even as eternal power and Godhead. And we, we look at creation, look at the, I mean, where do you start with this? It's not just the universe and the stars, but the earth itself. Um, you know, it's been a while since I told you about the sun and moon, right? Oh no, here we go again. But the sun and moon are exactly the same size from where we live. That's what the eclipse proved when the, sun, when the moon came between earth and the sun and the disk of the moon covered the disk of the sun. No bigger, no smaller, but exactly the same size. Hello? The sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but the sun's 400 times further away than the moon. But from where we live, the sun and the moon are exactly the same size. Is that an accident? Or is that by design? But see, that's just one of millions of design things, right? I mean, I've told you before, I love, I, I, I love, when you think about the human body and the intricacy and the design and the complexity of it, you know, how does something like that evolve? I don't, evolutionists have a lot of faith, I believe. How does, how does the human body, I mean, all the different things in creation, most creatures have eyes, that they all evolve independently because they're on different branches. How does that work? The organs in your body, what came first, your heart or the veins that connected to your heart or the blood that came uh, or your brain that makes it all work and the different organs in the body, they're all um, dependent upon one another. It all has to work together or it doesn't work at all. And then you look at your body and, and uh, the design of it, it's designed. Um, you know, you have, uh, you have a hand, two hands is a span, two span is nine inches. And a, two spans is a cubit. From here to here is a cubit. That's two of those. Um, and then this is the, from my fingertip to my fingertip is exactly how tall I am. Really? Yeah. Um, I love doing this. I, I take my, my thumbs together like this, put them together, and then I slide them down. And it's amazing how close, like, I mean, you can't get light in between there. Do you know what that means? It means that this curve is the opposite of this curve, but the same as this curve. Think about that sometime. Why, why is that? Why does it fit so how wonderfully together? You put your, I mean, our bodies are complex and intricate, but there's, they, they have the fingerprints of design all over them. And that's why man has to work so hard at falsehoods like evolution to try to get you to think that that's not true. Because God has given a witness of himself on the inside. And on the outside. So every man has light. The second principle is that light received gets more light. Now this is a biblical principle. And we find it many places in scripture. Let's go to Acts chapter 10 for just a moment. We're going to uh, look at a man by the name of Cornelius. And there's important uh, truths to be got out of this. But let's just read a few verses. In Acts chapter 10 verses 1 to 6. Light received gets more light. Everybody's got light. What are you going to do with that light? If you, if you turn the light off, what do you have? Darkness. If you reject light, the only thing left is darkness. If you turn the lights off, you're left in the dark. And so we get a, we get a choice with what to do with the light that God has already given to us. We can either receive it or we can reject it. Now in Acts chapter 10, we have a man... He was not a Jewish person. He was not, he was not a child of God. He was not saved. Um, he was a Gentile. He was a Roman. He was a Roman centurion. So he was a very influential, powerful man. And yet there was something about this guy. This guy had gotten light like everybody else. But there's something about this man that he kind of received the light. He responded to the light. Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. A devout man. And one that feared God. Now, wait a minute. Here he was. He's not a Jew. But the Bible says he's a devout man. In other words, he's, he, he, he lends himself towards religious things or the things of God. And the Bible says he feared God. 
That meant he would do things that were right when nobody else was around because he, he believed that there was a God and he feared God. Now he wasn't saved. And then it says, he gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. So there's a lot of things in verse 2 that helps us to understand this guy's responding to the light God's already given to him. He understands there's a God. He believes there's a God. He fears God. Uh, he goes towards the things of God. He gives alms to people. That means alms is compassion. The word alms means compassion. We're going to talk about that tonight. And uh, it, he saw people with, with need and he would give uh, what he had to help their need. And he prayed all the time. Now, he doesn't know God. He's not saved yet, but he prays to God all the time. What does that tell you about this man? It tells you that he's responding to the light that God. He's a conscience within. He fears God. He looks at the creation without. He prays to God. He respects God. He's open to God. And yet he's not saved yet. Why? Because he hasn't heard the gospel yet. Light received will get more light. And so... In verse 3, it says, He saw an evasion, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, it's 3 p.m. in the afternoon, an angel of God coming unto him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges uh, with Simon a tanner, whose house is uh, by the sea, saying, uh, That's down in Joppa, which is the next town down the coast. And uh, he, he will tell you what, the, uh, what thou ought us to do. And in chapter 11, it's, he repeats the story. And he says, he'll tell you what you need to do to get saved. So he didn't have enough light to get saved. And interestingly, the angel didn't tell him how to get saved. But the angel told him who to meet, to go to Joppa, to get a hold of this guy called Peter. And Peter will tell you what you need to do to get saved. So he was interested in God. He feared God. He gave to others. He prayed. And then he obeyed the angel in that he sent for Peter. He sent men down to Joppa. They got Peter and Peter and his buddies are coming up now to Cornelius' house. And you find in the rest of chapter 10 uh, that Peter preaches the gospel unto him. Verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, shall receive forgiveness of sins. You believe on Christ, you'll get forgiveness of sins. He didn't understand that yet. He didn't understand that in verse 3. He had to have more light in order to get saved. But the principle was that the, the light he already had, he opened his heart to him and he was receptive to it. You know what God did? He gave him more light and the angel came. And the angel says, now go to Joppa and you'll find a guy called Peter. And he'll tell you what you need to do. So Peter comes up and he opened his heart again. He opened his heart to the angel and that he was obedient. He sent people to Joppa. He was, he was, he was receiving the light. He, gets, he sends uh, men to Joppa. And here comes Peter. And Peter preaches the message. His heart is still open. He's still receiving light. He hears the gospel. He receives the light of the gospel. And he gets saved. Light received gets more light. Go back to chapter 8 of Acts. We run into a man here. Uh, again, another Gentile who was an Ethiopian. We call him the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter number 8. And in verse 26, it says, The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, and uh, unto the way that goeth from, down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Kind of interesting that the centurion had authority, he was a big wig, and this guy was really a big wig, this uh, Ethiopian. I mean, he was like the treasure of the Queen of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. Interesting that God, um, these people were saved and that they had influence other, over other people. But anyway, this guy was seeking light. He received the light that God had given to him, understood that there was a God in Israel, and that, the, that Jerusalem was the place to worship, and he goes all the way from Ethiopia. He's a black guy. And he's, but he's important, he gets in his, his chariot and he's heading to Jerusalem to worship the true God. But when he gets there and he's worshiping the true God, he's still not saved because he hasn't got the gospel yet. And so he gets, a, he gets himself a Bible and he's reading Isaiah chapter 53 and he's in the chariot reading it. He's open, he's, he's reading, he's drinking it all in, I want to know more. And he's now got the scriptures, and he's, those Old Testament scriptures, he's reading Isaiah 53. And then this guy's coming alongside the chariot, Philip, and Philip says this, he says, do you understand what you're reading? And your man says... I can't, I can, except someone who gave me. He said, come on up here if you, can know, if you know anything about this. So Phil comes up and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And he was still asking, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? 
And Philip began with the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And so when he heard the gospel, what did he do? He received that and he got saved. One night I was lying in bed and I'd heard, I'd heard about God, I'd heard about Jesus. And for much of my life, I was running away from that and I was doing my own thing and I couldn't care less, but it just was empty. It was empty. And I was successful at some things. I was successful at the work that I did. I was an apprentice of the year as a young fella, uh, learning my apprenticeship in the motor vehicle trade. And I was kind of proud of that. And then in the bagpipes, I was very successful at that. I was all iron champion when I was 16 years old. But you know what it was? All the silver cups, they ended up in my attic being all tarnished. People that go after the acclaim of this world and, and winning stuff, what you're going to find is that it's just ashes, it's dust. All those silver cups that I won, that I was so proud of in that moment, ended up in my attic, and when we came to America, I, th I threw them out. <laughs> they went to the tip. They went to the dump. The Bible talks about all of that as vanity. And I remember as a 17-year-old lying in my bed, Completely dissatisfied. Started working when I was 16. Thought that would solve my, my issues. Didn't. And I was lying in bed one night. And I was just fed up. There had to be more to life than what I was experiencing. And the light that God had given to me. I was starting to respond. I understood there's, there's got to be something more than this. God had placed that in my heart and my conscience. And I looked around me and it didn't make sense. There had to be some explanation better than I had. And so when I was lying in bed, having received the light that God gave to me, I started crying out to God. I started praying earnestly, maybe it's the first time in my life. And I said, God, there's something wrong with me. And I'm not a happy camper. And I'm reaching out to you. I'm, wanting, I'm asking you, God, to please help me. Whatever it is that's wrong, fix me. Whatever it is I need, help me. And I would genuinely, genuinely pray and ask God to help me. And I went to bed, or I was in bed when I prayed, and I fell asleep, and I got up the next day, and I forgot about it. New day. Went to work. Was cleaning the workshop, whistling a song in the church at that time, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. And the first time in my life, a Christian, a young fellow by the name of Wesley Reed, he was also about 16 or 17, came over to me, and he said, he said, do you believe in that? I says, what are you talking about? He says, that's a Christian song. Are you a Christian? I said, I'm not a Christian. Are you joking? He said, I'm a Christian. He says, I got saved about six months ago. And he started to tell me his story. And the foreman come by and he says, come here, you two. I want you to get on that truck and take the cylinder heads off it. So here are the two of us now, which we wouldn't normally be doing. But now we're working together on this truck. And for the next three or four hours, he's witnessing to me and giving me the Bible and giving me the gospel. And I'm asking him questions. And he's answering my questions. And then the foreman came back and he said, Wesley, come here. Uh, told me finish up and he took Wesley off the job and sir I'm sitting on this engine working away thinking about what everything that Wesley talked to me about that morning and then all of a sudden all of a sudden I stop and I remember what happened the night before but God spoke to my heart as I went as I asked God for help and in that moment as like God poked me in the side Tom that's what you're looking for that's what you're looking for I was so far away, it took me many, many weeks after that. These guys continued to talk to me and witness to me and coax me because I was like night and day to what a Christian was. But I, I got more light. They gave me the gospel and I kept listening. One day I was, clock, I was uh, getting parts at the parts store and we had this window at the parts store and we're just leaning over the counter waiting for the part to come. And another guy, Thomas Corbett, was a guy I went to school with, and he came up to beside me, and he says, he says, Phyllis, what's it I'm hearing about you? Everybody says you're a Christian now. And I wasn't. I was just talking to these Christians, and, but they thought I was a Christian. And I thought to myself, who is he telling me if I can be a Christian or not? I says, oh, that's right, I am a Christian now. <laughs> and, I, and I wasn't, you know. But I was just, I was mad at him because he, he was like, you know, how dare you become a Christian? You could never be a Christian. I says, well, actually, I am a Christian now, but I wasn't. And then that one Friday morning I was clocking in and this other guy, Alistair, he was clocking and he says to me, do you want to go to church? And I could have said no. And I almost said no. I says, there's no way to get there. He says, the pastor will get you. He'll pick you up. And I said, yes. And oh my goodness, I was so worried all day long on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. 
And then I got my sister to go with me and her boyfriend and my cousin and we went to church that night and the preacher from Alaska got up and he preached from the Bible, which I'd never heard before. And all my questions were answered in that message. And by the time we got to the end of the message, I knew what he was saying was true and real. And when he gave the invitation, and I didn't know what that was, but I bowed my head and I said, Lord, yes, I want to be saved. I heard the gospel that could save me and I responded to that. And I believed and I got saved. You see, late received gets more light. You say, what about these people in Africa who never heard the name of Jesus? If they receive the light of their conscience, if they receive the light of creation, God somehow will get the message of the gospel to those people. I guarantee you. Late received gets more light. But there is a third. There is a third principle, and that is light rejected gets darkness. Not everybody, in fact, I would say most people that have light don't receive it. They deny the light. They deny their conscience. They uh, go against what God has revealed. They try to explain it away. And if they cannot explain it away, they just ignore it because they're not interested. All they're interested is right here and now and how it affects me right here and now, which, of course, won't help them when they're dying. Go back to Romans, if you will, as we close. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, he says, because that, which the, because that when they knew God, by the way, verse 20, he says that God has revealed his light so that they are without excuse. Nobody can stand before God and say, well, I didn't know. God will say, well, do you remember that night you went out as a wee young lad and you looked up into the sky at night and you saw the stars and I spoke to your heart that there's a God. Do you remember that? What did you do with that? You said, no, you ignored that, didn't you? See, everybody has a conscience and everybody has the light of creation and so they're without excuse and so in verse 21 he says because that when they knew God did you know that everybody knows God to some extent but when they knew God they glorified him not as God neither were thankful you know it's, it's, it's hard for an atheist when he, his heart just wells up with thankfulness because of something good has happened and he doesn't know who to thank he has nobody to thank as a Christian when when you enjoy the blessings of God you can thank God because he's the one that gave it to you. But when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, became, they weren't thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They got light, and they rejected the light. When you turn the light out, what have you got? Darkness. You know, the Bible describes it this way, ever learning and never able to come under the knowledge of the truth. And there's people are searching and searching all over the place. Do you know why they're searching? Because and not getting the answer because they refuse the answer. Because everybody searches at some point, and if you continue to search and continue to ask the questions and continue to receive the light and revelation God's given to you, He'll give you enough light where you hear the gospel, you get saved, and you'll 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 get the answer. But when people are searching and they're, the answer is right before them, or the light of God is before them, they say, "Well, I'm looking, but that's not what I'm looking for." And so they leave what God is giving and they go over here and they're looking and looking and looking and looking. It's a mystery. We can never get the, here's the, you can't get the mysteries of the meaning of life. It's a mystery. We can never understand these things. You know why? Because they rejected the light that God has given to them. Ever learning, never able to come onto the knowledge of the truth. In verse 26, and actually verse, uh, verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. God gives you up. And we're going to talk about this next time. And then verse 26, it says, for this cause God gave them up. Twice he gives them up. And then in verse 28, it says, and, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You know, God's trying to get you. He's trying to woo you. He's trying to draw you. And people resist. You know, Calvinist believes in irresistible grace. Grace is always resist resistible. And people resist the truth of God, they resist the light of God, they resist the revelation of God. And when they do that, God, he, he, he tries to hold them, he tries to woo them, he tries to bring them, he tries to work with them. But they get to the point where they, and God just has to let go. He has to let go of you. And then what happens is darkness comes in. And darkness will lead to all kinds of destructive behavior and consequences. Let me just show you this as we close. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This verse used to really, really bother me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
Because, you know, the Bible, you know, God is an enemy and you have an enemy. The word Satan means adversary. He's your adversary, he's your enemy. And enemies seek to hurt you and harm you. And so in verse uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Can the gospel be hid? Verse 4, in whom the God, notice the small g of this world, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in unto them. So our enemy seeks to extinguish the light. Our, our enemy wants to blind our eyes. And in fact, the Bible says that's exactly what he does. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. That's why I said a moment ago, I believe there really is true atheists who are completely blinded, completely darkened. There's no reasoning with them at all when you give them the evidence. There is all kinds of evidence, but they can't see it. Why? Because they're in the dark. They can't see it. You used to say a blind man on a galloping horse at night could see this. But they can't see it because their minds are blinded. And it used to bother me that God would allow Satan to blind people's minds. That the gospel could be hid from people. You could, be, you could explain it as, as, as clear as crystal and it'd be like right over their head. In one ear and out the other. They're blinded. It's so frustrating. You just, can you not see it? It's true. Blinded. Complete and unbelief. And he used to bother me. And I said, Lord, why is it that you've allowed Satan to blind people's minds? And then I read the verse again. Look at it again. Verse number four. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Did you know that if you're, if you're receiving the light, Satan can't hinder you? If you're believing what God has already told you, he can't blind you. But as soon as you get to the place where you won't believe something, that opens the door for Satan to bring darkness in and blindness. It's exactly what Jesus said in the parable of the soils or the parable of the sower, where there's the four different kinds of soil. You have the hard ground and the shallow ground and the thorny ground and the good ground. And the first ground was the hard ground. And the sower goes forth to sow and he sows seed and it falls on the hard ground. On the path where everybody's been walking and the soil's been compacted in and the seed lies on top of the hard ground. And what is he talking about? Well, some people's hearts are like that. Now the good ground, it's been broken up and it's been plowed and the sower goes forth to sow and the sow falls into the soil that's loose and it gets in there and guess what? It germinates and it grows. And you've got the shallow ground and it grows for a little bit then it, it, it gets... It gets burnt with the sun because there's no depth of root. But the hard ground, that's a person's heart. A person can have a hard heart. And it doesn't matter who the preacher is. doesn't matter how nice you are. doesn't matter how clear you are. doesn't matter how convincing the argument is. doesn't matter about, about the seed. The seed is the word of God. And the same seed that falls on the good ground and will germinate, the same seed falls onto the hard ground and it can't get in because the ground won't let it in. A man has hardened his heart and he won't let the word of God get in. And what then happens? What is the parable? The birds of the air come and they pick up the seed that's on the hard ground. Now when Jesus gives the interpretation of that parable, the birds of the air are Satan. Satan comes and he steals the word away that has been sown that can't get into the hard ground. In other words, you're opening the door to Satan for him to bring darkness and blindness to your heart when you don't let the seed of the word of God get into you. And so when somebody doesn't receive the light that God has given to them, they're turning the light off, they're left in darkness. It's very, very sad. But you know, that can also happen to a Christian. We're talking about in Romans chapter 1, the condemnation of humanity. And that they're without excuse because God has shown himself to every man. He's the light that lights every man that comes into the world. But you know, those of us who have been saved... It's also true that we can harden our hearts as believers. You know, one of the most dangerous things you can do is come to church. Because when you come to church, you're exposed to truth. And when you're exposed to truth, then you have a choice. Somebody hands you something. You've got to do something with it. What are you going to do with the truth? If we as Christians harden our hearts, then and the light of the, of the truth of the word of God is not allowed to get into our life. If we don't hear, if we don't take what we hear, and use it and receive it and learn from it, then it will be stolen from us. It'll do us no good. It's like sitting down to a, a nice juicy steak. 
Put in your mouth, mmm, spit it out. You'll starve to death. You can have the best food in the world. And you can put it in your mouth. But if you don't swallow it, if it doesn't become part of you, then you're going to die. And the same thing's true as a Christian. The same principle is true for a Christian. If you turn the light out, you're going to be left in darkness. If you don't receive what God has given to you, it won't do you any good. Not only that, and you mothers will know this, when our kids were young, and Leslie would say to them, now, when you eat your dinner, I'll give you more. Or when, I eat, when you eat your dinner, I'll give you dessert. And they didn't eat what was on their plate. Do you think my wife's going to come along and put more on their plate when they haven't eaten what's already there? You know that's not going to happen. And you're expecting God to put more on your plate when you haven't even used what God has already given to you. I heard about a young preacher, and he preached in a new church, a new pastorate. And he preached the, the message. It was a beautiful message. I can't remember what it was about, but it was a wonderful message. A wonderful truth. And they said, well, that's a great preacher. A new preacher. A fantastic preacher. He gets up the next Sunday. He preaches exactly the same message. They said, well, that's kind of strange, but it was a good message. So we're, we're glad to hear it. He got up the third Sunday, did it again. Same message. Get up the fourth Sunday, preach exactly. This guy only knows one message. And the deacons got him aside and they said, uh, what's, what's the deal here? You, you pre you've been here four weeks, you preach the same message over and over again. He says, I know. He says, when you start doing what I preach, I'll preach something different. Now that's kind of corny, but the truth is really important. A lost person is without excuse because he has light. If you receive that light, you get more light to the place where you hear the gospel and you get seen. There is no excuse before God. God is a holy and a righteous judge. But friend, as a Christian, we've got to be careful too that that principle doesn't apply to us because God's given you stuff. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with what you've got? What are you doing with the light that you already have? Because the only way to go on in the Christian life is start using what you've got. Start obeying what you've got. And you know what will happen? When you do that, you're going to find new stuff, exciting stuff. It's not going to be stale anymore. It's going to be fresh. It's going to be new. It's kind of like the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. You know where there's no, no life in the Dead Sea at all? The salt, the salt content in the Dead Sea, you, can go into the, you can't swim in it because you're, you're basically all over the place. And you don't want to get that stuff in your eyes. When you, they tell you when you go into the Dead Sea, you just basically lie on your back. You'll see them lying there. I mean, you're basically just floating like because it's salient. It's the, 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 the salt content is so, so thick. Because the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea, but it doesn't flow out. When you take in, and you, but you don't, it doesn't produce life in your life. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, you don't use it for something. It's like the, like the Sea of Galilee. Jordan River flows in, Jordan River flows out. It's got life. It comes in one end, goes out the other end. If you're taking in what God has given you and using it and eating it up, it becomes part of your life. You're going to have life. If you hear messages at church and you go out and it doesn't change your life, it's a recipe for death. You'll not grow. And Jesus warned us about hardening our hearts, hardening our hearts. And so when you go to church, it doesn't make any difference really. Just go because of habit, routine, because you have to, because somebody's making you. But it doesn't do you any good because you're not receiving what you're getting. But if you would receive the light that God has given to you, it'll change everything. If you're here this morning and you're, you're not a believer, you're not a Christian, uh, can I tell you, you have no excuse. And you've heard not only from your conscience and from creation, but you've actually heard from this as well. So you're really without excuse. And what I would encourage you to do is obey the light that God has given to you. Receive it. You may not understand everything. Cornelius didn't understand everything, but he opened his heart. He used everything he knew. He was devout. He feared God. He gave alms. He prayed. He did the things that he, he knew to do. And when you do the things that you know to do, then God will open it up to the things you don't understand, and he'll give you more. If you turn out the light, you'll be left in the dark. Father, I pray that you'll help us all this morning to keep our hearts tender and open and receptive to the word of God and the revelation of God. And for those who are here or listening who are not saved, help them, Lord, not to harden their heart, not to shut it down, 
not to say no, because the God of this world will blind the minds of them that believe not. And they have truth that they're responsible for. Help them, Lord, to do the right thing with it. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to take our songbooks.